If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation. We are back in our study, and we're going to have some interruptions, okay? Uh, we have a Bible conference. Uh, we have to, uh, Mother's Day, you know, we have to do that. But we are going to preach Revelation every chance that we can uh, as we go through the Word. Revelation chapter 2, and we'll be looking in verses 12 through 17. Today I'd like to talk to you about, uh, and it's the third church uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, the compromising church. And just the title alone, folks, should tell you something. We should not be compromisers as Christians. There's Christian values and there's worldly values. And the longer we live, it seems like we get mixed up sometimes and uh, we seems like even sometimes in our worship and in our conduct and in our words, uh, we are probably not being the best Christians, uh, you know, examples to others. And Jesus here, I mean, folks, he was the one that wrote this. I mean, John penned it, but these are Jesus' words. So obviously in the day in which we live now, matter of fact, I'll say this, I cannot believe what some legislation is in our world. Folks, we used to be a one nation under God. We have in God we trust on our money, but yet we are compromising, okay? And, and Satan is having a field day. And we as Christians do not need to compromise our doctrine, our conduct, or our conversations. We need to be that light that was sung about. So comprom the compromising church, if you have a bulletin, you want to follow along with us, real simple, number one, Jesus' approval. By the way, he has a little sandwich here for you. He has a positive note, he has a negative note, and a scalding one at this, okay? I'm just giving you a heads up, uh, is what Jesus is going to say here in just a minute. And then he comes back and he praises us. And folks, every once in a while, we as Christians need a wake-up call. We need to hear from the Word of God. Instead of just attending church, we need to worship, and we need to apply what He says to our lives, and that is so, so very, very important. But we see Jesus' approval, Jesus' accusation. Okay, He is accusing, and remember what we said, it's written to these churches, but it applies to individuals. That's why everywhere, at the end of each one, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear. That is an individual decision that you have to make. We as a church can be a compromising church. And I am telling you, folks, uh, as long as I am pastor here, as long as I can live and breathe and preach, we will not compromise. I don't care what the outside world tells us. Homosexuality is wrong. Abortion is wrong. Adultery is wrong. These things are wrong, and so we will preach the Word of God. And the third thing, Jesus' admonition. And really, admonition means encouragement. He wants to leave you on a good note. He wants to leave you thinking, you know, uh, things aren't you know, as bad as some say it is. But I'm telling you, he really, really, in the second point, which we will see, uh, really chides uh, this particular church. You know, the church at Pergamum, and, and uh, Pergamum means marriage, all right? It means marriage. And do you know what the church is? It's called, in Revelation, the Bride of Christ. We are the Bride of Christ. And I'll be sharing with you one scripture that just talks about how important being the Bride of Christ is. But the city of Pergamum uh, was 100 miles north of Ephesus. It was located 15 miles inland on the Aegean Sea, Pergamum was a capital city and considered, the, of all the seven cities, the greatest city. Today, it is a Tur Turkish city called Bergama. It was built on a large hill 1,000 feet above the plain. It was an important center of cultural and learning. And in that day, it had a library that had over 200,000 books in it. Can you imagine that in that day and age? Pergamum boasted of four pagan temples that were tied to Greek and Roman deities. The city also was the first to build a temple devoted to emperor worship. 
And this was a huge problem in the days. The Roman emperors demanded that you worship them. Matter of fact, the school of me- a school of medicine was there. And more than any city in Asia, Christians suffered the most persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ in that city. To be called Satan's throne is a sharp rebuke from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at this third of seven churches. And, and we have to, you, you have to understand, each, uh, each church was different. Each church, uh, you, you know, and, and to say a church doesn't have any problems, uh, folks, it, you know, you just can't really say that. But God gives us a way. Jesus tells us what we need to be doing as his church. So let's see Jesus' approval, starting in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, these things says, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. And we said in the previous two that there were, uh, you know, descriptions or characteristics of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, If you remember in the, in the first church that we saw, he hold the seven stars uh, and, and the seven golden cam- candlesticks. He was talking about walking among the churches. And in the, circuit, and in the second one, he says, uh, I am the first and the last. I was dead and came to life. But here, he changes tones here. And he says, he who holds the sharp two-edged sword. What is he talking about? Well, folks, what I thought of was the armor of God in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Folks, the Word of God is is breathed from God. The Word of God, there are no errors. It is perfect. And we as Christians need to follow the Word of God. It It doesn't matter what man says. It matters what God says. And in God's Word, He says, thus saith the Lord. So already you can see He's pulled His sword out and He is warning the church, you cannot compromise the Word of God. Then He says, I know your works, and He does, where you dwell. And then He says this word twice, where Satan's throne is. And folks, when you think of Satan's throne, you think of a wicked city. We've already told you there were many, many pagan temples there. We've already told you that the emperors were, uh, uh, you know, commanded people to worship them. And matter of fact, when it talked about the persecuted church, there were people that were martyred, okay? They were literally killed for not bowing down and worshiping uh, the emperors. There were just so many pagan practices, mysticism, and, you know, all worship of just all kinds of pagan and false gods. So Jesus says, I know it's hard to live there. All right, it's hard to live there. And again, I'm not trying to pick on any city in particular, but a lot of times, you know, I, I think of Las Vegas and all the temptations there, all the gambling and women and all the drinking and all these things going on. But yet, folks, uh, uh, God places churches there. This church was there for a reason. And he's saying, like uh, Amy sung, we, even in where Satan's throne describes the city, we need to be the light of the world. And you hold fast to my name. It's saying that they were not ashamed to be Christian. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. They were bold in their witnessing. They stood up for God. They, they did the right thing. And he is, he is commending them. He, it, he is approving them in what they have done right and did not deny my faith to my name and did not my, uh, deny my faith even the days in which Antipas was among you where Satan dwells. And he gives an, he, he gives an example of a Christian martyr. And this guy was a leader in the church there in Pergamos, and he would not bow down. And they literally put him in hot oil and burned him to death. And by the way, you say, well, that wouldn't happen here. Well, can I remind you what book we are in? 
We're in the book of Revelation. And when the tribulation comes, I'm telling you, you will have to die for the cause of Christ. Okay? I'm just telling you, read it. We hadn't got there yet, but I'll point it out when we get there. But what I'm looking at here, I want you to see what happened at the first church, that Acts chapter 2 church. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 5. Go with me to Acts chapter 5. Let's look at the persecution during that time. And we know, uh, you know, you, you look early uh, in chapter 5, and the apostles did many wonders and signs among the people, the Bible says. And people were coming to them, and they were healing people by the power of the Holy Spirit and the, uh, the power of God. And then uh, Peter and John were thrown into prison, okay, because they were teaching about Jesus. And you know what God did? God broke them out of jail. He broke them out of jail miraculously. And again, the apostles uh, were on trial as this was going on. And those people uh, that, that, that were in charge were saying, I thought we threw them in the prison. How did they get out? They ended up standing on a street corner. What did they do? No, they didn't go to their house and hide and in fear. They went on the street corner and kept preaching Jesus Christ. So pick it up uh, or in, in verse uh, 26. And the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. For they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Okay, so there was a lot of folks, a lot of Christians running around there. So they had a fear for Peter and John also. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Notice they wouldn't even say Jesus' name. They just said in this name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. This man, he, they wouldn't say Jesus' name. But Peter, said to the, but Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Now, oh, folks, that's who we are. Okay, I'm not looking for a fight, but I will not back down from defending the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what they were doing. Now look at verse 40. And they agreed with him. Galileo, Galileo basically told him, man, if you just leave these guys alone, they'll go away. But they didn't. Look at verse 40. And he agreed with them. And when they had called for the apostles and beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. Look at this reaction. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know what some of us would do? We'd be singing, gloom, despair, and agony on me. We'd be whining. I got a whooping because of Christ. Oh, listen to me, folks. It is an honor. It is an honor to stand up for Christ. In that first century church, they did not care what others thought about them. They stood on the Word of God. They preached on the Word of God. And many, many, many people were saved because of their witness. So we see Jesus' approval. And he just said, you know what? There are a lot of you. And, and again, folks, I know this is true. Probably in most churches. Most churches, I'm telling you, the Christians are proud to be Christians. They you know, they, they want to be a light, they want to be a witness, and they do an excellent job. But yet, sometimes there are those few that seem to speak the loudest and seem to have an opinion, and that seem to even want to take over things. And, and this is what is happening, and this is what Jesus says about Jesus' accusation. And we, we look in verse 14. But... I have a few things against you because you have there, uh, uh, there those who hold the doctor of Balaam who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So Jesus stops after the approval and he says, I've got a couple of things that I have a problem with in your church. You are compromising the Word of God. And folks, I told you before, compromising is not good, okay? Especially when it comes to the Christian faith. 
Matter of fact, he uses an Old Testament example here, and he uses a New Testament example. And these are examples that we need to look at our lives. Why do you think he wrote the Word of God? Why do you think Jesus was chiding these people? Because they allowed some people to come into their church and have a big influence in their church, and it caused division in their church, and it caused problems in their church. Folks, sin is not good in a person's life. And tolerating sin is not good in a church's life. That is what compromise is. And when he says you hold to the doc doctor of Balaam, we know that Balaam was a prophet of God. If you want to read this, we don't have time, but, uh, uh, but Numbers chapter 22, Numbers 22 through Numbers 25, read the story, okay, folks? God... I'm telling you, he was not plain. He did not like what went on. And, and he was a prophet of God. Balaam was a prophet of God, and he was God's spokesperson. But what happened was King Balak, who was king of the Moabites, saw the, king, uh, the children of Israel coming into the promised land and invading and uh, just defeating all kinds of people. And he thought, man, we're going to be next. So I need to find some way to defeat the children of Israel. So he'd heard about Balaam, and he heard that he was a prophet. And what he did was he offered Balaam money to pronounce a curse on Israel. Three times, you know, the first two times, Balaam said, no, uh, you know, I went back to the Lord, and, and he said, no, you don't curse Israel. But the pot got big. Each time, he offered him more and more and more. And folks, we cannot prostitute the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't put money in front of God's will. But yet Balaam uh, just caved in. There was pressure, and there was this great temptation. And I'm telling you, if there's anything that our world and, and, and the whole world worships, I'm telling you, they worship the God of money. And we, we don't like to talk about it, and yes, we need to earn money. No, it's not wrong to be rich. But we have to put God first. We have to give God his part. And then he will bless us. And I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. So God got upset. All right? He got upset with Balaam because of what he was doing. And he said, you know, I said that you need to bless God's children. So what happened was Balaam still wanted the money, and he started compromise, and he thought, well, if I can't curse them, what I'll do is tell them to start marrying uh, the Moabites, which was a foreign god, and start hanging around at these temples and start doing these pagan practices. And folks, that's what intertwining with the world was in that day. And so they started doing this, and over a period of time, Israel fell, and they fell into sin and temptation and evil practices. And if you'll read uh, uh, the 25th chapter, I'm telling you, God's judgment fell. And 24,000 Israelis, he wiped them out. He wiped them out in one day. That's how angry God was. And folks, I am telling you, it's not good to fall into the hands of an angry God. And we make choices sometimes that go totally against who we are and what we are about as Christians. And God is not happy with that. And then it says in verse 15, thus you also have those who hold onto the doctrine of the Nicolo Nicolaitans, which I hate. He said that earlier. And what the Nicolaitans, I'll just remind you of, it was that group of people. And uh, some refer to uh, the, Nicholas, who was one of the, not disciples, but the deacons in Acts chapter 6, that he, you know, kind of got used to some power and running things. And he was wanting to take over the church. Their job was to take care of the widows and the orphans and to do these things so the apostles could preach and teach the Word of God. But in being in charge, he got where his head was big, and he wanted more power. He wanted to control the church. Folks, I'm telling you, I, don't in, I do not control this church. I'm the shepherd, 
okay? I'm the pastor. God controls this church. Jesus runs this church. The Word of God tells us what to say. But Nicholas, I mean, I, I'm just telling you, he was trying to take over, and this little set came up. Folks, deacons don't run churches, all right? Even in our setup, committees don't run churches. The church runs the church. We decide as a church what is right and what we can do. So what happens? Satan gets in the middle of it and divides this church. And there was a division in there. And folks, if God says he hates it, we need to, I'm telling you, we don't need that in our church. And we certainly don't need it in our personal lives. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 6, I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 6. And by the way, just for guests, there is not a division problem here. As far as I know, nobody's trying to take over. All right. We just follow Jesus. I'm just telling you what the Scripture means and what it says. All right? But look at this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, folks, we can hang around them. We can witness to them. We can be their friends, but we have to be careful that they don't influence us, all right? When I was a youth minister, I had one girl that was a very, very strong Christian girl, and she wanted to date this certain, and he was just a football player. And I'm telling you, my spirit, the first time I met him, I just thought, you know, arrogance, worldly, all this. And to make a long story short, she compromised her convictions because, and here's what she told me at first. She said, I just want him to be a mission project for me. I just want to see this guy saved. But folks, the exact opposite happened. He broke her heart. And I was there to pick up the pieces. Even though I warned her, we still love them. And folks, we cannot let the world invade our world. All right, we have to be strong. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal? Folks, look at the, the comparisons here. Those are strong words here. The Apostle Paul is writing to Corinth. To Corinth. Or what part of a believer is with an unbeliever? And what of agreement has the temple of God with idols? What is he saying in every one of those? They are polar opposites. Okay? They are opposites. All right? Yes, we need to befriend them. Yes, we need to witness with them. Yes, we need to love them. But we cannot let them influence us in what we believe. Now look at verse, look, look at the next part. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Folks, why do we come to church anyway? Just a place to hang out? No, it's to worship God. It's to have fellowship with God. It's to have fellowship with other Christians. It's to pray for one another. It's to get encouragement from the Word of God. And then verse 17, Therefore, come, up, come out from among them and separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord uh, Almighty. And again, folks, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, we can't have unbelieving friends. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we cannot let them uh, influence us in a negative way. Matter of fact, the book of James, James 4.4, in a single verse, says it better than, than any verse that, that I know. James 4.4, 4, look at this. And James don't miss words here, okay? James don't miss words. He gets with you. You adulterers and adulteresses. Now you look at, and you may think, well, I, I'm not either one of those. Well, folks, he's comparing that. Adulterers cheat on their spouses. Adulteresses cheat on their spouses. What he's saying, you're cheating on God. You're cheating on God. And it says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And we know in, intimate, enemy, enemy is 
is enemies. Okay, you can put the word enemies there. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Oh, folks, we do not want to be an enemy of God. And Jesus in this text was just chiding them and just telling them uh, the two examples of how you have compromised. You are, you are a compromising church and there are, there are compromising people in the church. I'll never forget an illustration that I read years and years and years ago. And it goes like this. Uh, Alexander the Great was the king of Macedonia. Uh, by the age of 30, he created one of the largest empires and armies in history stretching from Greece to India. He was undefeated in battle and was considered one of the greatest military commanders of all times. One day he was holding court uh, you know, for a soldier who deserted his post and retreated in fear. And King Alexander, and you can imagine being in that courtroom and him setting up on the podium and as the king, you know, sitting there and speaking to this young man and these bring this skinny young 19-year-old in and the 19-year-old kid would not even raise his head and lift it up. And so King Alexander addressed him and he said, young man, what is the charge? And, and he, he just wouldn't say anything. And he said, young man, I ask you what the charge was. And he just kind of whispered desertion. And then he said, young man, what is your name? And this young man would not answer King Alexander. So Alexander got up from his throne and went down where he was standing before him and looked him square in the eyes. And he said, young man, I ask you, what is your name? By this time, he was getting very angry, and this young man just whispered, Alexander. He said, what is your name? Say it louder, Alexander. And he, he, he just said, you know, you cannot do this. Because do you know what the penalty was for desertion? It was death. And he said, young yeah, man, do you not realize I have life and death in my hands? And he said, yes, sir. He said, I am telling you, I can give you life, but you have to promise me you won't do this again. And he said, yes, sir. And then he said this, young man, either change your conduct or change your name. I think sometimes God looks down at us and says, what are you? I'm a Christian. Who are you? I'm a Christian. But yet our conduct, our words, what we say, where we go, our actions don't match up. And I think sometimes God looks at us and says, Christian, either change your conduct or change your name. Listen to me, folks. People are looking at us every day of our lives. We can come here on Sunday, and I like to put suits on. I like suits. Nothing wrong with suits. But it doesn't make me a preacher. It doesn't make me a pastor. It's out there in the world. It's what we say out there. It's what we do out there. It's where we go out there. And that matters to God. And Jesus is saying the conduct of this church and these individuals need to change. Let's look at the last part. The very last part. Revelation. Number three. Jesus' approval. Jesus' accusations. And Jesus' admonition. I love how he starts with positive, lays the hammer down, and then he ends in positive. This is wonderful. Look at verse uh, well, look at verse 16. What do we have to do? We have to repent. What's repentance? It's not being mad you got caught. See, I'm telling you, that's what most youth, and, and I was a youth minister, folks, I'm telling you. And I was, I'm just telling you, you know, God can take the worst youth and make a good youth minister out of him because I knew all the tricks, all right? 
and you, you, he's saying here, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. Folks, this is the good news. As Christians, we are overcomers. We are overcomers. We will win. We will win. And then it says, I will give some uh, of you hidden manna to eat. He gives you three things, three words of encouragement. And we think, when we think of hidden manna, all right, uh, it's talking about the bread of life. And we know that Jesus is the bread of life. And he has given us the word of God. And what he is talking about, when is the hidden manna? If you think about it, it was in the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God was. And what I think this is, it's not only giving us the Word of God, it gives us the blessings of God. Listen to me, folks. As Christians, we are so blessed. I mean, we came in, we drove here. We had our heaters going. Yesterday, we had our air conditioners going. It's crazy. We have clothes on. We have, we have nice things. Not just physical blessings, spiritual blessings also. When we die, we go to heaven, folks. Jesus Christ died for our sins. So he will give us the hidden manna. And remember, even, and really it's talking about physical blessings and spiritual blessings. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, and he was judging them, and they were just wandering around there. What did, what did he do? Man, he threw bread down from heaven. And every once in a while, he gave them a quail, too. I mean, man's got to eat some meat. I don't know about you, but i got to eat some meat now and then. So this is blessings. All right? Blessings from God, that hidden manna. And it says, I will give, you, give him a white stone. A white stone. There's two thoughts here. The first one, when you saw a white stone in a court of law, it meant an acquittal. An acquittal. That means you are not guilty of a crime. And folks, i got news for you. We are all guilty of sin. Every one of us are sinners. But Christ died for our sins. And he has given us that white stone that says, not guilty. I am righteous because of Jesus Christ. Then the second part, and, and, and it, you can use either one of these illustrations, was when they were athletics events, that white stone was for the winners, for those winners. And what that white stone did, it got you into that banquet and into that special uh, thing of festivities also. And folks, I got news for you. What do you think of when you think of white? You think of the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God, and we are made righteous because of God. We are going to the marriage feast of the Lamb of God. We have an invitation written, written down in Jesus' blood. So we see the hidden manna, the white stone, and a new name. And again, this one is extremely hard to interpret, but somehow there is going to be a name, Jesus or God is going to give us a new name. And folks, I, you know, I don't even speculate how that's going to be or what that is about. But you just think about it, folks. I know when I was growing up, I, I had the nickname of Taco uh, because I played baseball and we had a taco eating contest and I ate 12 tacos <laughs> in one night. I'm pretty sure that name's not going to be Taco. All right? And I like my name. I like Michael. I don't have a problem with that. But from what this is saying, he is going to give us a new name. Oh, folks, he is saying to this church, you better wake up. Don't let false doctrine, false teachers, and false teaching get into the church. Stay true to the Word of God. And he's saying for individuals, us as Christians, individually, don't compromise your convictions and the Word of God. And I leave you on this note, Revelation 21, and I close with this. 
Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Folks, everything that is in heaven is ours. It's ours. We will be walking streets of gold. We will see pure water flowing. We will see trees and fruit trees like you've never seen. There will be no temptations there. There will be no sin there. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But notice the warning in verse 8. But the coward, the unbelieving, the bondable, the murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Folks, I'm just telling you, as we close, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? We are all going to stand before God. We're going to stand before God, and we're going to have to give an account of our life to God. And if you don't know Him, I am telling you, it will be the worst day of your life. The great white throne of judgment. Go to Revelation 19. It's clear there what happens. And some people will just say, well, I just don't believe in hell. Well, I do, because the Word of God says it. And I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm simply saying, this invitation is for you. It's for you. God has given you another chance to be saved this day. And if, you not, if you're not sure, if you're not positive when, you, positive, when you die, you'd go to heaven. Today would be a good day to make sure. Father, thank you for this day. And God, thank you for your word. God, it's your word. Man, I'm just preaching the word, just going right down through Scripture. And God, I thank you that we are not a compromising church. And God, I just pray that you would deal with us today as Christians, as individuals. God, I pray that we would ask ourselves this. Is there anything in my life that doesn't give glory to God? Is there any activity, anything I do that does not honor God? And God, I pray that we would confess that. God, I pray that we would pray and repent of that. I pray that we would ask you to forgive us. I even pray some would come and rededicate their lives to Christ. And God, again, Lord, I just pray for those who are lost. I thank you that you're a God of grace and you are a God of love. And they can be saved this day. So God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, I pray they would come and be saved. Others may need to come for baptism. Others need to, may come and and, and join the church. God, this is, your, this is your time. Whatever you ask us to do, I pray that we would be obedient. God, we'll, we will give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If, would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?